The idea of sanctuary cities has been gaining popularity recently with the election of Donald Trump and uncertainty for people with precarious status. Canadian cities have looked at becoming a sanctuary. But what exactly would that mean for people living in these communities? Michael Malewski is a grad student at the University of Victoria who lives in Regina and his thesis is on sanctuary in Canada. And uh, he joins me now. Good morning. Good morning. So tell me a little bit about what inspired this subject for you for your thesis well it's uh it actually goes back a few years and um when i first moved out to victoria and took my supervisor's grad seminar we were trying to determine uh an essay topic and i told her that the first ever news article i wrote at the carillon as a student uh contributor was about the sanctuary case in Regina of the two nigerian students that were going to be deported for working yeah. Two weeks at a and Walmart. And they took sanctuary and in they, a church for so long. For, yeah, for just over a year. Yeah. And uh, when I told her this, she was like, well, you should write your you should write your essay in this seminar on that, like give it an academic treatment. And then I was so interested in it that I made it my thesis topic. Did you have any idea it would become as timely? No. When, when I first started, it was not nearly as timely. And so I really lucked out. Yeah. yeah. So what does it mean? I mean, we, and we did several interviews about those Nigerian students and the idea of church as sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Can you explain, especially in a Canadian context, the idea of a Canadian city as sanctuary? Sure. So the first Canadian sanctuary city was Toronto in 2013. And essentially what a Canadian sanctuary city is, is um, they the city council passes policy that basically labels it as access without fear to city services for city residents with precarious status, uh, which is basically anybody without a stable status. Okay, so uh, what kinds of services then would that grant to the, to the people you're talking uh, about? Only the services that are under the direct purview of city council. So any initiatives that city council takes city by city. Um, What's more interesting is what it doesn't include is stuff like the library or anything with its own independent board, uh, which includes the police, which has been the very contentious issue. Tell me more about that. Why is it contentious? Well, it's contentious because many of the, uh, many of the activists uh, and some of the politicians want the police to be on board. And there's actually a massive misconception uh, that exists in a lot of articles written, and but also in the scholarship, that the city council policy applies to the Toronto Police Service, for example. It doesn't, because the Toronto Police Service is governed uh, through provincial statute. It has its own independent board. And then even then, the chief of police has a wide amount of mm. discretion. So give me a practical hypothetical example of the difference it would make if police were included in that sanctuary uh, protection? Well, the I should mention that the Toronto Police Service does have a partial don't ask policy about not asking people's status. I think that they passed in 2006, but they don't have a don't tell. So if they were included in something like the uh, Toronto um, sanctuary city policy, they wouldn't be able to turn people over to the, uh, um, the federal government if they found out that they didn't mm. have the right status mm. or if they didn't have stable status. Where's Regina at when it comes to uh, comes to this? Um, all that I know so far is that there's been a couple meetings uh, with different people from the community and activists. They're starting to kind of organize to make Regina Sanctuary City. And um, I think there's one city council, Andrew Stevens, uh, who's been posting about it and kind of uh, gauging and seeing what the interest is. Do you have any idea how many people would, would need this kind of protection in Regina? I'm not sure. And that's the really interesting thing about Sanctuary City is that um, what it's trying to do is trying to equalize status across the city. And what it's trying not to do is to br like bring those people to light, which is exactly what Church Based Sanctuary does. So it's actually really, really hard to get the kind of numbers, like the sort of the data about how many people. So personally, I don't know. And you'd have to look. But again, it, it'd be so hard to quantify the number because these are people that don't go and report themselves. These are people that are trying to hide hide and stay yeah. in the country. Yeah. And then that's what motivates the, 
the people to pass this policy is that so they, when they're living here, that they have a right to stay here and that they can access city services without fear of being deported. How many Canadian cities have, have gone this route? There's four with an asterisk because there's Toronto, then there's Hamilton. And then in 2016, Vancouver passed access without fear policy, but it refused to call itself a sanctuary city. And it says specifically in its policy document that it is not up to a municipality to declare sanctuary. So it was much more realistic in its framing of the problem. It literally called itself, more accurately, access without fear to those with precarious status. Or What do you think of that? Um, I think that's a much more accurate term. Because um, I think the sort of the appropriation of the word sanctuary is like rhetorically meaningful, but I'm not sure if it's accurate. And I, and if the city was actually a container that said, okay, the CBSA is not allowed to come in anymore and we're going to keep these people and we're going to have our own, that could be a sanctuary. And it'd be sort of like the biblical cities of sanctuary.